You will hear a woman phoning about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Hello, hello. This is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr. Crawley. He's at fourteen King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes, and then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's A P twelve seven Q T. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one too. What about a hair dryer? Maybe you should bring one if you need one. I'll buy one. Yes. And TV? Oh yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine, and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own rooms, okay, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest. Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. Okay. Now I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Are you familiar with this area? A bit, actually. There are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead, and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then, well, I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. Uh huh. I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction, and then, if you want a nice route, 
take the street that's slightly to the right. Then you'd want the second left, and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays, or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. OK? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library. And you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977 and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres, and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces, and it has a 1,000 staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. 
Right. Well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement, where you'll find the cloakroom. And to the left of that, we have the information desk, where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours, and anything you need to know if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor, we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one, so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor, and in the right-hand corner you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section, and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super-fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouillet 
Our all-around road bike is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The crankset has a 42 34 combination, running an 18 toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the Quick Beam if you choose. The Quick Beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900 or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light-touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on MSG. First, you have some time to read questions 32 to 41. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 32 to 41. You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favourite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? 
MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a chemical commonly used to add flavor to salty or sour tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908, but Eastern cooks have been using glutamate rich seaweed as flavoring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms. Bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavor of food. Foods often used for their flavoring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavor of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savory, broth-like or meaty taste. Umami may be the fifth basic taste beyond salty, sweet, sour, and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savory taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy, and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavors in a variety of foods such as meat, poultry, seafood, and vegetables. While MSG harmonizes well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods. Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8% MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavor. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavor of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavor. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome quality food and good cooking techniques. MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavor of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30%, but food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as 1-2%. to Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use but for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.